everyone, um, welcome back to our series of videos on YouTube that are coding advent of code problems in Rust. Um, I am once again Brian, and if you guys have not been following along, this is the sixth day of a series of videos uh, posted on my YouTube channel uh, that cover advent of code 2019 uh, in Rust. So. Uh, I imagine you're watching this on YouTube. It's the only available place. So if you click around and haven't seen the first videos, you can always go back and watch those before you watch these, although this one will be fairly self-contained. Uh, so uh, don't feel like you have to. Um, the code for all of this is, once again, on in this repository, BC Myers AOC 2019. Um, so if you want to take a look at that at your leisure, um, this is where you go to find it. And with that, let's just get into it and start talking about the problem today. Today's problem is another good problem. Uh, I've, I've liked the problems so far, and this one is a different thing than we've done before and super interesting. So uh, once again, I don't want to read you the text. Uh, it's pain. So I will sort of boil down the problem by talking about it here. So basically, we are given as input a graph. So here's an example. Um, of the kind of graph we're given. Um, the way we're given this data is in this format, in a text file. So once again, I always like to come down and look at the puzzle input. So it's a bunch of lines of some identifier and this uh, parentheses and then another identifier. So this information encodes a graph, which if you look, want to look at it visually, it looks like this. Um, and I should go back up to day one. It looks like this. So what we're asked to do in the first problem is to find, uh, well, how do we explain this? So these represent planets and the planets are orbiting each other. And so I think this means that B, everything to the right orbits the thing to the left. So B orbits calm and C orbits B and D orbits C and there are two things that orbit D, E and I. Um, but we are going to stop talking about orbiting and we're going to start talking about parent and children because this is a directed graph and it has a root node and so we can think about this as this being the root and these being children and these, you know, the, the child of calm is B and the parent of B is calm. Um, so what we're asked to do is to find the total number of direct and indirect orbits. And so what they mean by that is, let's take a look at C. C has two um, direct and indirect orbits. Um, it has B and it has COM. And so basically what we're asked to do is to find the level of C. So C is on the second level here. If we count the root as level zero, the B would be at level one, C and G would be at level 2, H and D would be at level 3, level 4 is E and I, level 5 is F and J, level 6 is K, and level 7 is L. And so what we're asked to do is define the level for each node in the graph and then sum them all up is basically the problem. Um, so uh, we get to work with graphs and graph traversal and figuring out all kinds of fun stuff that I think you're supposed to cover in Computer Science 101. Uh, which I would know better if I ever took a Computer Science 101 course. Uh, but I know enough to answer this problem. And one of the reasons I know enough, and I should mention this, is there's so many great resources on YouTube, and uh, I can't recommend more. Um, the sort of computer science stuff they have uh, available on YouTube from MIT. So this is here is a great video if you don't know anything about graphs and you just want to start uh, digging in. We're, uh, basically, we're going to be doing breadth search search today on a graph. And so watch Introductory Algorithms video and it will give you a good idea of how to approach a problem like this. Or even after you watch this, you'll sort of recognize right off the bat that this is a graph problem and it's traversal and we should think about breadth first search and depth first search and which one is better. I mean, just sort of having that in your toolkit is great and um, you can find resources on it. So uh, the other thing I should mention is my sister is here with me wrapping Christmas presents. So she's in the background and has insisted uh, that we listen to Christmas music. So you might hear a little bit of Christmas music um, while she's wrapping presents next to me. 
Um, so with that, let's sort of dive into it and start coding. So do I have a tmux? Oops. Do I have a tmux session? I do. Let us attach to um, our AOC tmux session. We'll be on our Windows setup all nicely. Open up the code and get prepared for day six. So we need to add a day six file. Um, we need to add it to add this module to our library. We need to add it to our main function. Day six. Day six. And we might as well add it to our benchmarks as well. And I still have not gotten around to making this so that we no longer have to manually change all the numbers. But I will promise I will do that eventually. Because what I'm doing now is really a pain. But let's see. This needs to be a 6. This needs to be a 6. This needs to be a 6. And we need to add a sixth target. Uh, 06. And this cannot find the right the module. This needs to be a six. Maybe because RLS is just not finding it. So let's quit and restart. And that was nope. Can't find function. Oh yeah, of course you can't find the run function because we have not created a run function. So let's go into our day six file and create our own function. But let's steal the signature. And we're probably going to need this stuff as well from day five. And let's go into day six. And there we go. Um, we will not need our computer for day six, though. So let's say unimplemented. Uh, and let's say that we don't need to use you yet. Alrighty, so that should compile and we're done with our setup. And if we try and run day six, it won't work because we don't have the input data and we're gonna panic in that function. But one thing we will need is the input data, so let's copy that over. Um, let's see. In our data folder, let's add day six.txt come in here and paste day six. So, ooh, there's at least, uh, well, we're gonna have a big graph, 15, uh, 1,500 things. All right, so now let's run this. <coughs> Excuse me, and see if we run into the panic that we anticipate getting because we are unimplemented. And indeed we do, panic not yet implemented. Um, so, Let's dive into day six. And I guess, so we get things to run, like we always do, let's return junk here. So foo to string, uh, bar to string, and this needs to be a tuple. And too many parentheses. And there is no method to stir, but there is a to string method. Oh, I did it here as well. I did in fact need that. There we go. So now when we run it, we should just get foo and bar, which we do. All right, so I'm gonna start out with an abstraction and we're gonna progressively improve on it. So let us create the idea of a graph. And this graph is going to be a hash map of, we'll start out with strings, but change that eventually, a hash map that keeps a string, which is the idea of every single node. And then for every node, we are going to have a vector of its children. Um, so that is our graph. And what we need to do is first be able to construct a graph from our input. So let's create a parse function, or parse input function where we take in our data and 
and we return a result of a graph. Well, yeah, sure, a graph or an error. And let us implement this function. But we need use standard collections hash map. We're going to use all kinds of collections today hash maps, hash sets, vec decks. It's going to be exciting. Um, so uh, let's remind ourselves what our data looks like cat uh, data 06.txt. So we have many, many lines in this file. So let's use our kind of verbose but most efficient way to read in information line by line. We say uh, loop. And we say if reader dot read line into a buffer ever equals zero, then we know we're done with the file and we break. But otherwise, we have filled our buffer with what we want. And on every iteration of the loop, we create it. And we need a buffer to fill to begin with. So string new. Um, all right, and let's return unimplemented from this function so it stops yelling at me. Um, and there is no method f named readline found on type R because we have not told it that R needs to implement the buff read trait. And now it should no longer yell at us for that. And this is standard collections hash map. So. Um, binary operation cannot be applied to a result because this can fail. So we need to propagate the error. And we cannot borrow reader as mutable. So let us make it mutable. Um, okay. So now we are reading every single line. And the way to read this is, let's go back to the input. Suppose you have the following map. So the parent is on the left, right, left, and the child is on the right. So we will say, uh, let parent equals uh, buffer dot trim dot split on this parentheses character uh, dot map, let's say, S dot trim again for good measure. I don't think we're going to need it. And two string. Um, and that should get us. And oh no, what we need is an iterator. We need mute iter. All of this business needs to be our iterator. And now to get the first item out of that iterator, delete to the end of the line. There you go. Um, we will call iter.next and this information needs to be there so this returns an option if it's none it, that is an error um, so we need to say error unable to parse input line da -da -da. Uh, and the line is buffer Dot trim. So let's say let line equals buffer dot trim, and let's say line dot split, and then we can say line here. I'm closing my parentheses, so this is now a result. So let's um, propagate the error if we have one. So that is the parent, and so the child should be just another call to our next on our iterator. And that should be um, that all done. But let's, because we're using the same error, just come up here and say let error equals a closure that, take, that returns an error. In fact, it returns this error. Let's copy that. Uh, but we don't have line, so we can't do this. Never mind. Um, okay, so now we have our parent and our child as strings. 
And in order to create a graph, what we need is a hash map. So we'll start a hash map up here. Mute map equals hash map new. And every time we get a parent and a child, we need to take our map, call entry on it. I'll do a better job of explaining the entry API this time. Put our parent in, which is going to be the key, and call um, or no, what is it? In or insert with an empty hash map. No, an empty vector. Um, and that gives us back a mutable reference to the value. So let's dereference it. No, let's not dereference it. We can just call push on that directly and push the child. So now we have entered the parent and the child in the hash map. So let me explain entry again. I, again, this, this entry API is really nice and rust. So you have a hash map. You call entry on it and you give it uh, a key in the map. If that key exists, well, actually, when you call entry on it, you get back this object called an entry. An entry object has this method on it called or insert with. After you call this, if this key existed in the hash map, then this whole business here returns a mutable reference to the value that was in the hash map for that key. So in this case, our values are vectors, so that's why we can call push directly on what gets returned from here. If, however, this key is not in the hash map, what this business will do is it will enter the key in the hash map and it will put in the hash map a whatever we put here, so a brand new vector. And it still returns, right, all this business still returns a mutable reference to the value in the map for that key, but now we're guaranteed to have a value there because if we didn't have one, we just added one. And that's why, again, we can just call push here and we everything works. So that is our first version of a graph kind of complete. Um, so now all we need to do is come down here and return a graph that is just a wrapper around our hash map. That is correct. Okay, so up here we want to call, we want to get our graph out. So we're going to call parse input on the read, the input, and this can fail. And that means we need our input. And so now we should get a graph out, and we should be able to parse it without running in any errors. So let's run this and see if it worked or not. Oops, nope, don't cat, run. Good, we didn't get any errors, so that I think means we're parsing correctly. Let's, um, let's print it out just in case. Um, print line, graph, we'll have to print it in debug, which means our graph will need to implement debug. So let's derive all the things on it. So we could probably make it clone, we can make it debug. We could make it, can you make a hash map eek? Not that we'll use that. Um, we can't make it hash, because hash maps are not hash. But that should be good enough. So now we're going to print out a big, big bunch of data, which is great. So what's in this map, remember, are the keys are nodes, and the values are a list of that node's children. So it looks like a lot of graphs just have uh, one child. But here's, here's, a, here's a node that has two children. So FJR has two children, which is great. OK. So where do I want to go to next? I want to, um, on our graph, implement a method. So the first problem is asking us to find, uh, I don't know what the technical word is, but I'm going to call it the number of connections. 
So again, if we're looking at C, C uh, is, we're going to say, using my language, which probably is not how other people talk about it, we're going to say C is connected to B, and we're going to say C is connected to COM. And likewise, H here, we're going to say H is connected to G, it's also connected to B, it's also connected to COM. So for every node, we want to know how many connections it has, and then we're going to sum up across every single node in the graph those connections. So how do we do this? Well, what we should do is traverse the graph and visit every node. And there are a couple ways to do this. Um, but we're going to do it one particular way because it is the best way to do it for problem two. Uh, but it's also just the first way I tried. And we're going to do something called uh, breadth first search. So let's implement, implement breadth first search. Let's call our function for the moment BFS. It's going to take a reference to the graph. And it's going to take a node at which we start. And our nodes are represented by strings for the moment. And this is going to return a u size, a result of u size or error. So I guess we can say we can call this in connections, um, which is what we're looking for in the first problem. All right. So how do you do breadth for search? Well, it's fairly simple actually. Um, we're going to say. Um, we're going to say we have a queue of things to look at. And this is going to be a vec deck, which is like a vec, except for it is more efficient to, well, it, it's like a vec, except for it's more efficient if you, when you need to treat it like a queue. So you got a bunch of stuff in your vec. Um, let's say this is the front of the line. Oops, over here. Ah. Over here is the front of the line, and over here is the beginning of the line. So uh, when you add something to a vec deck, you usually want to put it on in the beginning because that's uh, the whole data structure is designed for that to be efficient. And then if you want to pop something off, you pop it off at the end because, again, this whole data structure is designed to be efficient for that. And the difference is the only difference with the vector. I mean, there are many differences. A, like, I mean, this is a kind of a ring buffer. We could go into a whole deal about like explain your ring buffer and how vec decks work. But suffice it to say that uh, inserting to the beginning of a plain old vector is like really inefficient because um, you cannot, what you have to do if you had a plain old vector, right, and you want to put A on the beginning, and this is what you started with, is it would, uh, you'd have to take the entire data and copy all of that data over by one, and then you'd have an open slot to put your A on. Um, Vectors are really efficient if you want to add to the end, but they're really inefficient if you want to add to the beginning, whereas a vec deck gets around that, and so this is what we want to use. Um, all right, so we're going to have a queue. We're also going to keep track of um, which nodes we have visited, which, let's say, is a hash set of strings. So uh, equals hash set new. And I'm going to keep the, I'm going to keep the types here. Um, not because you need them in Rust, but just because it's uh, it's interesting for me to keep track of what we are, what these types are exactly. Um, let's do unimplemented, and we cannot find these two types because we have not imported them. But I told you that we were going to use all the things in the collection module. So vecdeck hash set hash map and so now you should work okay so we got a queue and we got visited and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add ourselves to the queue so q u e u e dot push to the back of the queue the back of the line uh, ourselves so start and we are going to also push ourselves visited to visit it. Insert ourselves to visit it. This is where things get a little sad, right? Because we're dealing with strings. We need to now clone. We will do away with that later. 
Um, and we cannot borrow, we cannot do this because these are not mutable. All right, so now we're good. We've got a queue. We've, our start, the beginning node is in it. We've got visited. Our beginning node is in it. So now let's say, while we have something in the queue, uh, while we have a node in the queue, so queue dot pop front, um, we want to do some stuff. What do we want to do? Well, we want to look up all of our children. So we say, if we have children, if let some children uh, equals self dot zero dot get node. Yep. So if we have some children, for each child in our children, we want to say, have we visited you before? So if we only want to do something if children, or if visited, does not contain the child. I think this needs to be a reference. So if this is true, then we want to sort of process this node. So we're going to process the node, and certainly once we process the node, we want to mark that we have visited. So we will visited dot insert this node of child. And we will also put it in the queue so that we can eventually look at its children. All right. And actually what we want, why do we need, these don't need to be strings. We can just put in a reference to start here and a reference to start here. And so now, uh, we can add, if we have a, let's say reference to a node here, and a reference to children here, These are going to be stirs. These are going to be stirs. Mm. This does not need to be a reference. And let's see what it's yelling at us for. So, self.0.get node. Can I do that? Oh no, now it's a stir stir. Okay. So the problem here, this all this sometimes happens with uh, strings and stirs. So git takes something that imp implements borrow, which is a trait uh, and that has an, uh, a type associated with it of stir. So you see this, it like the trait standard borrow. <laughs> How do we explain this? Um, I think we can get around this by doing this. And then I will go maybe try and explain it. Use standard op deref. Yes, that works. And this should do the same thing if we can't just do that. Yeah, this does not work. So deref. All right, so now everything works. So let's talk because we ran into this problem. Let's talk about the um, borrow. Let's talk about borrow. And I wasn't anticipating on talking about this, so hopefully I can explain it. Um, all right, there's a trait called borrow. And when you look something up in a hash map, so when you call like get on a hash map, what you pass it is. Let's bring that up to Rustbeck. 
By the way, I'm, I don't really want to see a VEC. It's just that if you type into Google Rust VEC, uh, there's like a 100% chance that you get this page <laughs> of the Rust documentation. Um, and so that's why I always type in Rust VEC to find what I want. So let's go to hash map. And let's look at git, git, git. So git takes a type Q, which is hash and eek. Okay, whatever. But Q. Um, okay, so the key of the hash map. So hash maps have two associated, well, three associated types themselves. Hash maps can have are generic over the type of key they take, the type of value they take, and also this random state thing, which we don't need to worry about. So hash maps are generic over their key. And all their key needs to do is implement hash unique, right? Which makes sense, because you've got to be able to hash something to put it in a hash map. So this key value has to implement borrow of Q. And we're, the git method takes a reference to a Q. So when we get something, and we need to make sure that whatever our, the type of our key, the type of our hash max key is, implements borrow of Q. I know it's super confusing, um, but it makes everything work really well. So let's go back to borrow. And uh, I mean, borrow is not very exciting. It just has a method on it called borrow, which gives you a borrowed. Um, so remember, we had to be borrow of k of q, right? So our key needs to be borrow of whatever we pass in to get. And if you come look at string, string is going to implement borrow. Uh, borrow, borrow, borrow. It's going to implement borrow of stir. <laughs> um, okay, which means that we can pass in. Remember, so this is our queue, right? This is the queue that we can pass in to get. So remember that for us, it's it's stir, right? So let's go back to get. get method on a hash map. All right, so we can pass in a queue, uh, which is stir, which means we need to put a ampersand stir, a reference to a stir in here. That's what we, that's what git takes, right? So here, this needs to be a reference to a stir, right? But why is this not working? Oh, why is this not working? Because I thought node, you say, was a string. And surely, if you ask for a reference on a string, it gives you the type we're looking for, which is ampersand stir. Well, you would normally be right that Rust is smart enough to figure that out. But sometimes it is not smart enough to figure that out. But what is great about a string is that it deref's into a stir. So deref is an implement, is a method you get from the deref trait. So we should take a look at that. And deref, or actually, we should look at string and see what it derefs into, because it, it implements deref. So let's look at string and come down here and search for deref, or let's just search for de deref. Yeah, so here we go deref target stir, um, which means that with the deref trade, The deref trait, uh, it's got an associate type which is a target. If you call deref on it, it gives you a reference to that target. In the case of string, the target is stir. So if we call deref, we are guaranteed no matter what to get back an ampersand stir, which is what we want. And so this is a way to work around the issue. And um, 
I don't know. Sometimes uh, the borrow checker and everything in Rust can be a little bit complicated, especially when you're starting out. But uh, I promise you that once this sort of clicks in your brain, it is not going to be hard at all. Um, it, I, I guess, is harder for me than it should be because I didn't explain it very well. But um, after you play around with Rust for a little while, you're gonna, you're just gonna know this stuff, and you're also gonna know maybe if you don't know it fully. So when I first started, sort of running into these kind of issues. I didn't really know all the business I just talked to you about. I just knew that it's a trick sometimes to always call DREF and see if it works. And then what's great is if you can get it to compile, um, you don't even have to know why it works. But knowing why it's well, knowing why it works is really interesting too. I think another way uh, another way to do this is to take take the um, a reference to the node. Well, what is this type, by the way? Uh, what does it think this type is? Like, why does it think this type is not a stir? It thinks this type is that, which is not exactly the same thing. So if we dereference this and then call ampersand on it again, maybe it will think it's a stir. No, it won't. The most surefire way I know when you run into this problem to get when you have this, and it can't figure out that what you mean is this, the best surefire way that I know to get around that problem is to do this. This is another reason, by the way, that we are, at some point, not going to take strings anymore. Um, we're going to do something more efficient and better, which doesn't have to mess with this stuff at all. Um, all right, so where were we? Uh, Let's recap where we are. So we're trying to find the total number of connections in this directed graph. And we said we need to look at every single node in the graph and figure out what layer or level that node is in. And that is the number of connections that we're looking for. So we need to sum up the, uh, we need to look at every node, figure out what layer it's in, and then uh, sum those all up. So the way we do that is to do breadth first search. Um, to visit every node in O of n time. It's actually, I think breadth first search is O of the number of nodes plus the number of edges. Yeah, it's linear in the number of nodes and the number of edges. Um, so to do that, we have this sort of queue of things that we are going to uh, check the children of. We have a visited thing that says, have we visited this node yet or not? And we sort of put the root node in these at the beginning, and then we say, okay, while we have some things to check out, while we have some work to do, right, let's see if this node has any children. If it does have some children, let's loop over the children. And if we've already seen the child, then don't do anything, right? Come down here. But if we haven't seen it yet, then we need to do something with it. So this is we were here is where we were visiting the node. We're visiting the node for the a node. We're visiting child for the first time, right here. So after we do some stuff with it, we mark it as visited, and then we put it in our queue because we want to visit its children. So it will eventually be popped off here, and its children will be processed. All right, that's step first search. Hopefully, I explained it. All right, so what we want to do down here. Uh, is we want to keep track of the number of connections of this node. And where we want to know what the number of connections of this node is so that we can add it to a running total um, that we are going to initialize up here. So this is eventually what we want to return in connections. But for a particular node, right, we need to know what level it's on in order to uh, in order to get this number here that we're going to add to our running total, right? Um, and so the way to do that is to say, well, we're going to keep track of we're going to keep track of levels, and we're going to say this is a hash map of uh, stirs 
two levels. And we are going to say that uh, this is a hash map new. So for the first no for the first for the root node, right? We know that le our levels for the starting node is level zero. So we say that up front. And then every time we visit a child, well, we know what the level of its parent is. Just think about the first node, right? Like so we know the level of the first node. So we're gonna come in here, we're gonna get the root node's children. So clearly we know the level of the children. It is levels.git of the parent. This can this should be unwrapped because we should always have seen the parent before we see the children. Um, plus one, right? Like our level is one more than our parents' level. Uh, so this is our level. And this should be good. We might have the same problem with DRF here, but let's figure that out later. Um, so now that we know our level, let's make sure that we record in our map that us, the child, has a level of level. So that when we go visit its children, uh, this will not fail, right? We'll have, we'll have it in our hash map that we're keeping. So that is how we get out the level. And then we just want to add the level to our running total. And that should be good, except for this is number of connections. All right. Um, so I think this is good enough to get us the answer to problem one. Uh, let's see if I know what I'm talking about or not. So we have a graph. Let's take our graph and call in connections on it and pass it a starting node. Oh, the starting node in the problem. So if you read all this stuff, you'll figure out that it's always called, it's called com. So we know that the root node is called com. Uh, so let's say com uh, to string is the start, and we said this could fail. And this returns us the number of connections. And let's print it out. And see what we get. 241064. And I think that's the answer to the first problem. 241064. All right. So there is uh, part one all done. So let's say uh, in connections to string. I forget about that. And so now we only have bar to do. But before we do that, well, actually, uh, I'll, we'll, 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 do, we'll do bar. OK. All right. So the second problem is really interesting. Uh, so it adds to your graph instead of, uh, well, in your graph, you're going to have a U and you're going to have a SAN. So here's Santa. <laughs> He's off on some planet orbiting I or whatever. And you're here. You're on some planet orbiting K. And, uh, well, you need to get to Santa, right? <laughs> so the elves need to know how many steps it would take you if you could move along this graph to get to Santa. So in our case, it is, well, you take a step here, two, three, four, five, six. So this is six steps to get from you to Santa, uh, is the length of this path. Except for there's a little, uh, there's a little twist, which is for whatever reason, they say don't count this uh, length and don't count this length. So they, they want you to output four here which is uh, not that, but then one, two, three, four. But I, I'm going to solve the problem by solving for six, and then we'll just subtract two at the end. So, uh, so we're looking for the shortest path from you to Santa in the graph. 
And previously, we were treating this as sort of a directed graph, right? Where we have parents and children, right? And there's like a directionality to our graph. But if we treat this as an undirected graph, like we don't care uh, whose parents and whose children, we just worry about if you're a neighbor, right? Um, and so you is going to be a child of K, and it is also going to be, uh, K is also going to, uh, how do I say this? I mean, they're neighbors, right? So you is going to have in its neighbors list K, whereas before, you is on the end here. So we didn't have any children for you, right? But now with a directed graph, we're going to have a uh, neighbor for you, which is going to be K. So this changes the problem just slightly. Um, we're still going to be sol able to solve it with, oh, the other thing I should mention is the reason why breadth-first search is great for the first problem, uh, probably for other reasons it's great for that, but it's also great for the second problem because if you do breadth-first search, then you're guaranteed to find the shortest path through a graph. Uh, and you'll see how we do that. All right. So, 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 here, we come down here, and we're going to construct a graph. But we actually need two graphs. We need to return two graphs, right? So let's return the first graph and the second graph. Oops, graph. Um, and we'll call this graph one, and we'll have a graph two, right? And when we push here, we're pushing to graph one. And this is graph one. And we're also returning graph of the map we're calling graph two. Um, there we go. But for graph two, right, we no longer care if uh, you, you, we no longer care what about directionality, right? So before, if you uh, is on the end here, in our sort of hash map that we constructed in the first part, it would have an empty vector as its value in our hash map. But we don't want it to have an empty vector now. We want it to be connected to k. And if we look at like c here, c in its vector of children only had d, but now we want to have it have d and b. Like, we don't care. We're going to treat, there's no directionality of this graph whatsoever. So to do that, all we have to do is we have to say, well, graph 2 is going to have uh, an entry for every parent. <coughs> and we're going to push the children in there uh, in, into the vector that is the, the, the key of the hash map, or the value of the hash map. But in addition to that, we're going to add an edge that goes from the child to the parent. Because, there, I mean, there's no distinction here uh, between child and parent in an undirected graph. So we want to do this, right? And I, this should yell at us for... Um, oh, it's yelling at us for a different reason. I was wondering. This should yell at us for borrowing, or for borrowing reasons, right? Like we're, we're consuming parent here, and so it is no longer alive. So we can't use it down here, right? What we're going to have to do is we're going to have to, well, we'll get to that. We're going to have to clone these. Um, but uh, let's fix the problem up here. So no method name in connections found for type because now this is graph 1. And we don't care at the moment about graph 2. And this is graph 1. So there we go. That fixes that problem. And so we should have new problems down here. And we do. We're trying to use this moved value, right? So that's no bueno. So that means we have to clone here. So sad, we got to clone, but we're going to fix all this cloning business. We're going to fix it. Uh, we're going to fix all the cloning business, so I'm not even that worried about it. Uh, but this will get us an undirected graph, which is great, because for the second problem, we want an undirected graph, and we're essentially going to do breadth fruit search again. Um, but how are we going to do this? So we're going to give ourselves a starting node and an ending node. Uh, well, actually, no. I, I, let's just let's just do the function over again. Um, 
there's not a super clean way to make one function uh, work for both problems. So what we want is the shortest distance between A and B, right? We don't care what's the start and what's the end because the shortest distance will be the same no matter which one we start with. Uh, we don't care about number of connections anymore. Uh, we don't really care about a start or an end because we're treating everything the same. So let's just say A is the start. And we don't care about number of connections. Uh, but what we do care about, right, is we get the level of the child here. So we're visiting all the nodes, all the nodes, all the nodes, and every single node that we visit, we get its level here. Well, if this child is the end, we're done, right? We just return level. Return OK of level, right? But we cannot compare this to so we can do that, and that's it. So uh, we, we visit nodes, we visit nodes, we visit nodes, but if we find the, the, the node that we're looking for, that we care about, right, we, we break early. And I just noticed that this function can never fail, so why are we doing this result business? Let's just do, let's just return a u size from both these functions. This one actually, this one needs to return an option because the shortest distance, if for whatever reason this graph is, there, there are disjoint parts of this graph, which is not the case here, but you could theoretically have that and breadth first search would still work, then there will be no shortest path because there's no path between the nodes, right? Like if we start at, if we start at A and there's no way to get to B because we have a disjoint graph, Right. Well, then we're never going to find B, and we're the, like, what do we return here? Right. Well, who knows? So we return nothing. Um, but in this case, we are always going to find. We're always going to find what we're looking for, but technically, this should return an option. All right. So that is, I think, shortest distance done. Um, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so let's check that. Uh, so we got our second graph, two, and we just say uh, shortest distance equals graph two dot shortest distance, and we want to go from us to string, and we want to go to Santa to string. Um, This no longer can fail, and this is an option. So if we can't find anything, that's that's a problem, right? We're gonna say okay or else. Uh, error uh, could not find a path from us from us to Santa frowny face. Double frowny face. That's so sad. Um, what's even sadder is that I can't get these parentheses to work out. Okay. Uh, go to the beginning of the line. You come down here. Uh, you come down here. You're not connected to anything. You are connected to something. But uh, why is this not working? It could not. Oh, it's because we have two exclamation points. Get rid of that. And now you should work. Okay, good. 
So the answer, right, answer two, we said was the shortest distance minus two because they are asking you this question weirdly in the problem. But that is not important. And this is a result, and so we need to propagate. Uh, and we don't need to do answer two, this is answer two. And let's call this answer one. Well, we keep calling that one in connections. Um, so let's run this and see what we get. We get 418, which is indeed the right answer, 418. So that's, uh, that's me going on a sort of not very coherent, because I didn't plan on talking about it, rant on sort of the borrow trade and uh, how sometimes when you try and get something out of a hash map um, and your keys are strings, um, it gets confused and cannot understand that a reference to a string type uh, should be able to be sort of automatically turned into a reference to a stir. Um, and so if you ever have this problem uh, and don't understand what I was talking about, just call DREF on it and then you should be good. So we did that and then we showed you breadth first search uh, to visit all the nodes and get out the information that we want. Um, but we have this nasty business, right, of like, well, we need to have two different graphs, right? Because, and let me, ex well, I guess I already explained why we need two different graphs. Um, but we, 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 have to, we have to have all these strings, like, all over the place. That's not fun. Um, and so, um, well, first of all, let's benchmark this to see how, I didn't do this before, but let's see how, how, let's see how fast this runs, and then we'll compare it and see if we actually speed anything up by doing what I want to do next. So let's run cargo bench. Um, uh, day 06. And I'll drink some coffee while we do that. Oh, yeah, this is a hell of a lot slower. I was getting benchmarks around like seven seconds on my final answer. So I think maybe we'll get like over uh, over 50% speed up with what I want to do. Uh, but let's let this run and and record the data so that we'll have it. Yeah, you can see I've run the I've run this before, right? So it's it's over twice as slow. Um, all right. So how do we improve on this? Well, the problem is all this all this allocating of strings. That's 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 no good. So what I want to do is every time we run through a line of data, right? Uh, well, let's have a running, let's have a sort of ID variable up here. Mute ID equals zero. And let's say that we have another map of IDs. And this is going to be a hash map. And to show you, to make this, uh, you don't have to write this type here, but to make it clear what we're doing. This is going to be a hash map from the strings that we're worried about to an ID. So we're going to keep the, we're going to construct this once and sort of keep it around, right? Um, and this is going to hang around and allow us to do conversions from uh, the name of something to this arbitrary ID that we're creating. But that means that our graph, uh, when we construct our two graphs, right? Instead of using strings as the identifiers for each node, we can just use these u sizes, and that way um, there will be no extra cloning here whatsoever, and there'll be no uh, no cloning in here. Well, there wasn't any cloning here, but it will actually there was there was some cloning here, right? Because we have to, or not some cloning, but we have to like create a string to put into these functions. This would not work very well, I don't think, if... Maybe you could get this to work if these were references to stirs, but I'm not entirely sure about that. Yeah, you probably could. These would have to be references to references, but that would probably work. Uh, but anyway, we avoid all this allocation business. Um, so, what we want to do is we want to say, um, if we see a parent, right? So, ids.entry um, and uh, or 
insert width. And if we have not seen this before, we want to give it an ID. Right? Um, great. Yeah, but we only want to give it an ID if we have not seen it. If we have seen it, then we want it to keep its old ID. So then we can say id's.entry uh, child and do the same thing, or insert with id. So whatever child, we're gonna give the, or not id, id plus one, because it needs to be a different id, right? Um, so if we have not given, because we could have seen, as we go through this loop, we're gonna get a parent and a child, but we could have already seen them before, right? They could be repeats. Uh, like maybe you see the parent, and then when you're visiting some other parents, right, that parent, the first parent happens to be a child of the second parent, and maybe it's a child of some other thing, and so we could see these multiple times. So this ensures that we give them sort of unique IDs as long as we come down here and we say ID plus equals two. And we don't really care what these IDs are, we just wanna make sure they're unique for every child and parent. Um, so great. So now let's use the uh, Oh, and this is, this returns us, right, the value. So this is gonna be the ID of the parent, if we dereference it. And this is gonna be the ID of the child, if we dereference it. So now we have the ID of the parent and the ID of the child, and let's put these in our adjacency map, or in our graph. ID uh, parent, um, ID child, ID parent, ID child, ID child, ID parent. Um, but that means our graph is now going to have to deal not with strings, but with u sizes, right? Um, so let's come up to our graph here and let's make it generic, because why not? Because before we did strings, now we want to do u sizes, but let's just, uh, w one of the things I want to talk about today is how to, how to do generic stuff in Rust, which is totally overkill for this problem. I mean, what we really should do is just make these u sizes and forget about it, right? Maybe we'll do that. We'll do that to begin with, and then we'll make it generic later. All right. So uh, our graph is now has keys as u sizes and vectors of IDs or u sizes as the um, values. So, um, so that should be good, and we probably want an, uh, an ability to even after we return this from this function, right? We want to uh, be able to take a, take a string and figure out what ID it is. So this function should return like IDs. And uh, all IDs is, right, is it's, uh, it's the hash map we just created. It's the hash map of u si or string to u size. Um, okay. Uh, type equals. There you go, okay. So uh, we need to we need to return that here. So this is our IDs. And now this, this parse input function should work and we're doing a little trick here uh, to basically only, uh, only allocate the, uh, the strings once, right? Or e each, each node uh, is, is got a name, it's got a string as a name. But, uh, and they're all here, they're all, all those strings are sitting in this IDs uh, hash map, right? But they're only there. Our graph is now dealing just with numbers and uh, which, uh, you know, we can copy around without having to worry about heap allocations or cloning or anything like that. Um, so we're good. But this means that, uh, this means that um, our stuff up here is all messed up. So that's IDs. Uh, this 
a node is now a is now represented by a u size, right? A particular ID, and we can just uh, insert those directly, right? Because these now need to be hash maps from u size to u size. And this is a vectec of u size, and this is a hash set of u size. Um, okay, and now we go through and we do this nice stuff. Or no, that this is probably this one. Yeah. Uh, star, star, uh, star. What? What are you doing? Okay, go back up. There. Star. So this makes this just like so much cleaner. And here we don't need to worry about deref anymore and this weird sort of thing with the borrow trade. Right? It all just works and we can copy around willy nilly. Alright. So same thing down here, right? We want nodes are represented by U sizes. Um Da da da, da da da, uh, da da da, da da da, da da da, and you guys get the ideas of what these types are. So let's just erase them. They were there so you can sort of keep track as you're watching, like what the heck we're talking about. But hopefully, uh, hopefully they're not needed. Oh, and. Uh, that, that, that. Okay. Uh, let's get rid of them. Well, let's leave them up here, just in case, you know, you want to know what the types are. All right. Uh, so with that, everything will work, except for up here, right? When we call in connections and we give it the root node, we need to give it the ID of the root node. But luckily, we're going to know what that is, right? So we just say ids.get uh, com, right? And if we can't find the ID of com, then there's a problem. So uh, uh, com node missing. And this gets us back the ID of com. Right. So now that's what we, when we ask for the number of connections, we do it from the ID. Um, and this is a reference, so dereference. All right, and same thing here. We need to get out the ID of you and the ID of Santa. So you, Santa, and you, and Santa. And this is now ID you and ID Santa. And we don't need DRF anymore. And hopefully this just works. Let's run it. And it does. It just works. Uh, that was those were the right answers. So let's see how much faster it is. for five seconds. Uh, oh, it's not going to be that much faster. Because I guess it's because I'm doing OBS that all my benchmarks are slower. Um, but it's still going to be a little bit faster, I think. Yeah, we got about a 20% improvement by um, avoiding uh, all those allocations. Um, Alright. So that is... 
I think maybe all we need to do to solve the problem. Um, but what I wanted you to talk about was generic types in Rust. Well, the first thing I wanted to talk about before we talk about generic types is, and this is just kind of an ergonomic thing or something you might want for like APIs you design. It's to it serves no purpose for this problem, but it's just an excuse for me to talk about some interesting stuff in Rust. Notice how this type of graph, like this graph is basically just a hash map, right? It's a hash map where we added two additional methods to it, shortest distance and in connections. But it'd be nice if like, you know, we could treat it as if it were a hash map as well, right? Like why I, I want to be able to call get on this or, or you know, insert or entry, uh, but I can't right now. You know, in, in this file, I can do it if I had a if I had a graph, right? I could do it on this file by doing dot zero and then calling an entry, blah 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 blah. But if I don't make this public, right, then I don't have any of that nice stuff outside this module. So how do you get that? Well, you implement deref for, and maybe this will help explain what deref does for graph. And deref needs to know uh, two things. It needs to know the target type that you want to dereference into. So for us, this will be a hash map of u size and vector of u size. And then it needs to know how to turn a reference of itself into a reference to this target type. And it knows how to do that very easily in this case. It's just that. So now we actually do need deref. We need standard deref deref, and we're about ready to do deref mute, and we're going to do some others too. Uh, but for the moment, let's just do that. All right. So that's deref. Um, so if you have an immutable reference to a graph, um, you can now automatically call any of the methods on its inner type that you could call if you had an immutable reference to a hash map, and they'll just work. So if we did, if we had a graph and we did graph.get whatever, that will just work now. Um, we can also um, get all the methods for which you need a mutable reference to the object. And you do that by deref, implementing deref mute for graph. And it doesn't need to know a target because um, deref mute requires that you have also implemented deref and so it knows the target from up here so here you just say give me the de uh, implement the deref mute method which takes a mutable reference to a graph and outputs a mutable reference to the target and we can get that by just saying at mute self dot zero so now we could call, um, if we had a graph, we could call um, insert on it, say. And it would insert into the hash map. There are a couple other traits that are, if you're trying to like just sort of emulate the or give give access to all the functionality of the inner type to the outer the wrapper type, there's another one that's handy if you're dealing with a collection, like a hash map or a vector or a vec deck or a hash set or something like that. And that is implementing from iterator. Let's go here. So from iterator is this trait. And let's implement from iterator on our hash map. Oh, and this comes from from iterator, and this this little parameter here is, uh, well, you know if you have a vector and you call into iter on it, and then every time you go through an iteration, you get some sort of value. Well, that's what this is. So for a hash map, right, it's the key, it's a tuple of the key and the value. 
So in our case, it's a tuple of u size and vector of u size. Um, and this t needs to be just a t. And then we uh, say that if you call, you'll get a graph that is self.0 dot, zero dot uh, is hash map from iter self.0. So, impl from iterator for graph. All right, from iterator, iterator, blah, blah, blah. Cannot find type A. Type A is a tuple of u size and vector of u size. And expected value found. Oh, we don't have a self here. We have uh, from iter of iter. Actually, yeah, I, that should work. OK, we could also do this. Maybe this is easier. Iter into iter. All right. So what this gives us is if we have a graph, and let's say we map over it, and we get, because uh, map, OK, so map is a method. Map is a method on hash map that takes a, uh, a reference to self. So we can call map on a graph because we did this, right? But let's say we do a map, so we get a key, we get a, the the key and the value here, so some key, some value, and we do some stuff with it. We like transform it. We do like key plus one value. So if we wanted to collect this back into a graph, that is principally being able to do this is principally what implementing from iterator on our graph type does. So that is, again, all of this stuff has nothing to do with the problem. We're done with the problem, obviously. But now what we're sort of discussing is if you have like a simple wrapper type like this, how do you make it sort of behave like its inner type without having to, um, you know, implement all the millions of methods that HashMap has on your own? Hey, can you be quiet? <laughs> My sister is making noise, um, like a lot of noise. Um, all right, so uh, so that's all done. And then um, some other ones, I guess we won't do this, but some other ones that you probably want to implement if you're trying to do this is uh, standard convert as ref. Um, you can see like it's got a required method. Uh, it is generic over T, right? And it's got as ref hands back. Well, let's just implement this and we'll, we'll show you what it does. So um, let's see, as ref. So let's implement as ref on our graph. Um, and what we can reference ourselves into, right, is a hash map of u size to vector of u size, right? Um, and all we have to do is implement this. Um, hash map u size vector of u size one too many angle brackets there um, so that's just self.0 right implement for graph and so now that we have this I don't know if you guys ever seen these functions where they're like uh, functions open a file and it's generic over a p and you say path is a p and this returns you I don't know nothing and then they say where p is as ref path so this is a very common thing to do in an API um, so now instead of having to pass like instead of having to pass to this function like a path a reference to a path you can also pass a reference to a path buff because that implements as ref path. Or you could pass it a stir because that uh, implements as ref path. 
or I think you can pass it a string because that implements as ref path. And so this allows you, if somebody has ever written, <laughs> I doubt they've ever written this for a hash map, so this is why I didn't sort of go to this one. But if somebody has ever written a function where the generic parameter is a hash map of, like, the, say, a key and a value, right? Uh, K, V, well, then we could pass our graph in here and it would work. There's also um, an azref mute, um, which is less common. Um, and then there's those borrow uh, traits, borrow and borrow mute. Um, and uh, so I think that's enough about this, but hopefully uh, it gives you just a flavor of um, what you can do <coughs> to sort of have your own wrapper type and give it all of the nice stuff of its inner types that you want. Um, so, so one of the reasons why, so let's, let's show, let's give an example of how this is useful. So we come down here, now that we've implemented deref and deref mute, right here, these can be, ooh, let's do this too. Let's, our graph should implement default, right? Um, There we go. Um, why is this a problem? Oh, hash map into it or dot collect. There you go. That's how you do from iterator. Okay. Um, now this can be these graphs, right? That we these hash maps can be graphs to begin with. Right. So now these are graphs, but even though we have graphs, right? Where we can do entry on them. Um, well, I guess that's all we're really doing. We're doing entry on them, right? And so down here, we don't have to do this. We just return our graphs, because they are graphs. And that's a little bit nicer. Again, totally unnecessary, but hopefully you learned something about Rust. Um, all right. So the last thing I wanted to do was to talk a little bit about how am I doing on time? I've gone for an hour and a half. Um, Let's do this anyway. Let's make a generic graph. So if we ever wanted to do a slow version of a graph where we do strings instead of IDs, um, let's make this graph type be able to do that, because what the heck. So we want our graph to be generic over T. So graphs are now going to look like this. So you can have any kind of representation for a node that you want in here. Um, but because we're putting things in a hash map, this T needs to be eek and it needs to be hash. So use standard hash hash. Right, so now we have our graph is completely generic over how we want to represent the nodes, right? Um, so that means all this business needs to do Every impl block has to do this. This is kind of a pain. Um, t, T. That works. If we have a generic graph over generic over T, then that should work now. From iterator, this can be a T, and this can be a vec of T's, and we need to be generic over this, and we need to return a graph that is a t generic over a T. This needs to be some other, let's call it I. Why is this not I anyway? Um, okay, so you should work. Are you working? Oh no, this one needs the hash thing, so we say where T is eek plus hash. Oh, 
and this is not t anymore, it's i. And what's the problem here? Cargo check. Uh, well, let's let's come back to this uh, error. Uh, so this is also needs to be generic over a graph. This is now a t. This is a t. Um, this is. Um, oh, it's because I kept the types on here. So t to u size t t. This is definitely going to need um, t to be eek and hash. It might need some other things. No, it doesn't. It's good with that. Okay, so that's done. Oh no. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, start needs to be a t. Right. We should be calling these in because they're how you represent a node. So apologies, this is going to take a while, but we're just going to come back up here and change all of our t's to n's because that's better. So let's start at the top. Uh, run clone. Oh, here we go. This is where we started, right? Um, in 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 oh, sorry this is tedious guys I'm apologize for this um, but let's just let's just bang it out um, in uh, in this does not matter at all. It's just more intuitive for me. And if you know, let's say this were actually a library, and you somebody were using it, right? Like it would be easier for them to get what was going on with this generic type parameter if it is clear that it represents your representation of a node. Uh, T is too generic. I use T for like generic type, but uh, oh yeah, this is the problem that we need to come back and solve. And then these need to be ints. All right. So you just now you just work now. Okay. And so now the parse input method has got to return graphs that are oh, ints that are generic over ints, right? Which means this thing has to know about what type n is. And right now we can say in is anything, right? Oh, we might have to say in, yeah, where in is eek plus hash, right? Um, I don't know why you're yelling at me there. Oh, parse no, parse input is um, parse input is a specific. We've written it to be specific for graphs of u sizes, right? There we go. So th this function, just for us, right, um, is is giving us graphs of u sizes. So now everything should. Uh, okay. So if you need to be hash and eek too, let's make you hash and eek. Is eek plus hash. Where in is eek plus hash? Because you guys get it, right? Like, we need to put something in a hash map, so it's got to be hashable, and you have to be able to do check it, check it if it's equal to another thing of its type. Uh, and now we just have this problem, which is the only problem we have left, and let's see if we can solve it. So, can we solve this from. Uh, from just uh, saying, can we solve it by just saying, ha uh, yeah, hash map from iter, iter? Oh, it's because we never changed this. This is why it's yelling at us. 
There we go. All right, but now we're going to run into the familiar borrowing issues um, because when we weren't generic, right, and we were just using U sizes here, then we didn't have to worry about um, the clones and, and, and uh, the clones because we, we had a copy type. But now that we have a generic type that really could be anything, um, we're going to have to clone, which means for all this stuff to work, uh, our type is also going to have to implement clone. Um, and here we are going to have to clone A. But if we have a copy type like U size, this will just copy. Um, then we're going to have to clone A there. Actually, no, let's not do this. Let's have let's have our function take references to in. Right? Um, and so these hash maps are going to be references now. And uh, can I do this? Let's see what our problems are here. So, oh, well, first of all, these are not going to have, we're going to pass references to U sizes. Here, and we're going to do the same thing up here eventually. Um, because we want this to be a reference to n. Alright, um, okay. Now, what errors are you giving me? Let's do this. Alright. Uh, Expect the type parameter found reference to n. So, if we make this ref, will you work? Nope. Okay. Oh, now you work. Okay. Um, and this is probably just going to have to be that, and that, and that. There we go. And so this is going to be that, and that, and that. And there we go. Do we have any errors? Cargo check. So now we have made, we've successfully made our graph uh, completely generic over how we want to represent nodes. Uh, the only thing that we are restricted on is however we want to represent nodes, that type has to implement eek and hash, which makes sense because we're putting it in a hash map. Um, but otherwise, we could represent nodes as i32s or strings or uh, foos or bars or um, UUIDs or whatever you want to do to represent your node, you can now because we have made We've genericized all the things. And I think that's all I wanted to talk about today. Let's, uh, let's cargo check and cargo run again. Because hopefully I, hopefully I didn't actually mess up our hash map or our graph. This should still just work. It's got, it takes longer to compile because it's got to do all of this uh, generic typing business. Which is a downside, so maybe you don't want to make stuff um, maybe you don't want to make stuff generic because it takes longer to compile. Are we going to get a speed improvement? I don't know why we'd get a speed improvement, but it looks like we might. No, same time. Alright, so let's do cargo run 6 uh, and pass it data 06 to make sure that we still get the right answer. And we do. And let's add uh, the final thing we need before we can commit is we need to add tests. So to test this, uh, let's come back here and pull in this business. Uh, configure tests or configure test mod tests 
use super star uh, test function test 06 and our input is no, oh, I guess I overrid my clipboard. Our input is this which is a string that looks like that um, but let's put it all on one line and these are separated by uh, new line characters so can I copy and paste and paste and paste and paste paste there's a faster way to do this I know I know I don't know them that well yet sorry um, and then get rid of the white space So this is going to allow us to test uh, part two because it has you and it has Santa in it. Um, so let's say this is for um, part two, and um, here you can go over there now. All right. So what we want to do here is we want to. Uh, our functions take readers, right? So we want to say let reader equals IO buff reader new of input. And we want to say run on no. We want to say let graph equals. We don't really have a way to create a graph from input, do we? Um, but that's fine. We'll just call parse input. Um, so we call parse input on reader, and this can fail probably. And this gives us a graph one, a graph two, and IDs. And we should do this up here because we're going to need it for number one. Oh no. Uh, yeah, we gotta do this twice because the input is different for these. Um, so now we need uh, we need to call graph two because that was our undirected graph, shortest distance, and give it the ID of you and the ID of Santa. And this is gonna be some number. Let distance equals that. And we can just unwrap here. Um, and this is as bytes. Because uh, an IO buff reader um, cannot take in a string, it has to take in a, um, a, a slice of U8. Um, all right, so now we need the IDs, right? So the way we get the IDs is we say let ID U equals IDs dot get uh, u dot unwrap uh, p reference and id santa is ids get santa unwrap oh uh, this is fine because we are now passing references to u sizes so that's good and we need to assert eek dist equals uh, uh, the shortest distance is the shortest distance is I guess we did it here. Let's just look at it. It's, um, well, the way we're calculating it, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Um, so they're looking for 4, but we'll just say 6 there, because that's how we encode it. That's how we're dealing with distances. Uh, this needs to be unwrapped. 
and that is that is testing part two. So let's test part one, um, and that is the same input except for we don't have you and Santa. Uh, so the graph stops there, and we need to deal with. Oh wait, did I overrode the wrong? This needs to be graph two, and we don't need. Let's call this. Uh, well, this is undirected, right? And this is undirected. Let me, let's make that clear up here too, just for people reading the code. So this is uh, a directed graph. This is an undirected graph. And so this is the directed graph. This is undirected graph. This is undirected graph. This is undirected. And this is directed. Um, OK, so here we pull out the directed graph. And we get the ID for com. Uh, com. Oops. Com. And we ask what the, what did I call this method? The in connections are for ID com. Right? Oh, directed. And now we assert that in connections, in connections is equal to, I think the answer is. 42. Let's check that. Because uh, I did write test for this one. 42, yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's our tests. Let's do cargo test. And they did not. Oh, they did run. Here they are. And they, they're okay. Okay, good. Uh, why? We have one, two, three, four. Oh, yeah, we didn't do test for day five. Um, okay, let me look over the code one more time, uh, and I think we're ready to push to GitHub. Um, take our input. good. We got our unnecessarily genericized graph. Uh, and we have our core functions. Did I need clone on here? I don't need clone anymore. Let's take that off. We don't want a uh, trait bound that is unnecessary. Um, okay, so that's all good. And this looks good. And parts input looks pretty good. And our tests look good. Um, so let's run all the things one more time. So cargo test, good. Cargo run day six with data 06. That looks good. And let's run cargo bench day six warming up 12 seconds let's see uh, let's see how fast we get I mean, I guess we didn't improve anything, so there's, it's not going to get faster. But uh, well, it did, but that might just have something to do with the fact that I, I don't know why it, it got faster. All right, so let's uh, get status. We change benchmarks. Live in main day six. Day six. Get uh, get diff. Yep. Oh no. 
why am I why am I out here again? Get diff. There we go. Huh. That's funky. Katie, can you do that someplace else, please? No. Uh, like, seriously. My sister's being super loud with her wrapping paper. Like, I'm almost done. Can you just hold off on for like five minutes? Like, really? Stop making noise, please. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Get status. Get diff. That is super weird. Well, we're gonna we're gonna add all and commit anyway. <laughs> Day six. Get push and see what happens. So there we go. Um, just because I'm I'm weirded out by that. Okay, but um, so there we have it. That's uh, day six complete, and hopefully you guys had a good time uh, looking at it. It's um, I mean it's a good little sort of just basics of graph traversal problem. Uh, that I think was pretty fun. So we got to cover what is a graph, or well, I didn't talk about what a graph is, but graphs, we got to cover uh, directed, undirected, uh, depth first search, um, you know, some interesting little minor micro optimization to get rid of uh, string allocations. And uh, hopefully this is a good solution to the problem. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe there are faster ones, better ones, but this is the one that I came up with. Uh, actually, I actually haven't looked at anybody else's solutions for this one yet, but I'll, I'll go online after this and uh, try and figure out if I miss something or is there something better to do that we can improve. And uh, again, hopefully I will keep up making videos. I, I, I This is taking a whole lot of time, so I can't promise I'll keep doing them. But uh, I love uh, I love sort of talking about Rust and teaching Rust and the I learned, uh, like I said, I, I'm sort of learned a lot of programming by watching other people explain things uh, on YouTube uh, in this sort of fashion and I found it um, very very helpful and a really good way for me to learn and so I just want to give back a little bit and talk to you about some of the things that I've learned in Rust and it seems to be a fun way to do that to work on these uh, advent of code problems um, and so hopefully I will see you for uh, the next one. Thanks.